To be the man, Daddy, you gotta beat the man. To be the man in the greatest sport in the world, you gotta beat the man. To be the man, <laughs> you've got to beat the man. Hey guys, welcome back to the Blood and Black Rum Podcast. I'm Ryan from Coldsploitation.com, and I'm joined with my co-host Martin. How's it going? Pretty good. It's a new year. It's a new Blood and Black Rum Podcast, right? So, uh, starting out fresh, going with uh, going in a new direction. Uh, I don't think we've ever talked about wrestling before, have we? No. No. This is, and actually, it's weird because, well, I mean, you probably mention it here and there because you, yeah, you're a big wrestling fan. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I'm white. <laughs> I am white trash. <laughs> Grew up with it. I, you know what? I was uh, used to be a big wrestling Well, I, not a big wrestling fan, but I did used to uh, get WCW Magazine. Oh, <laughs> WCW Magazine. Yes, I sure did. Yeah. I don't know what possessed me to ever be like, yeah, you know what? I, I think it was... Uh, I think I just saw it in uh, saw it in stores one time, like because I used to go to a uh, local grocery store, which at that time was what uh, Shop and Save, and um, I used to look at the magazines while my parents were shopping. And for whatever reason, WCW magazine stuck out to me, and I was like, "Oh, I should pick that up." So yeah, I was a a reader of WCW hmm. back in the day. Well, I'm proud of you because. Um... When uh, but we, as everyone knows, we grew up in the '90s. Uh, when you know the wrestling boom of the Attitude Area era and WWF was kicking off, and WCW and NWO and all that, I was one of the few WCW fans. I think the only one school that I knew. Everyone else watched the WWF, mm-hmm. and it, I watched. I think the WCW. I would flip back and forth in between Raw and Nitro. But I mainly, you know, like WCW. And that lasted until Goldberg lost at Starcade by getting fucking cattle prodded. And that's when I was like, yeah, fuck this. <laughs> Even at eight years old, I was like, this is, this is fucking stupid. I'm going to watch Monday Night Raw for now. <laughs> and, there was, and there was no looking back. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, I watched it for a long time, like up until like 03 stopped fell off of it and then just randomly like 10 years later i was like i wonder what's going on wrestling and i just started picking it up again so i still follow it i don't really watch it as much anymore because it's too much wrestling now there's just a it's just like everything now that if you're a fan of there's too much of a dearth of shit to watch so i just keep up with what's going on but so like yeah because like they have do they still have the wrestling channel the the wwe channel network it's on uh that's on Peacock now. So, I mean, like, if you think about it, it's like the proliferation of just so much stuff to, like, keep track of, keep up with. It's just... Well, it's, it's not even uh, WWE now. It's There's AEW, All Elite Wrestling, that's been around for almost five years now. That's, uh, like, the, your WCW alternative. They bought Ring of Honor not that long ago, so they also own Ring of Honor now. There's, uh, you know, a bunch of indie promotions out there. TNA still is... 20 years run running still going on and each show has like a just ridiculous like you know a bunch of fucking content it's hmm. just too, it's too much to us and yeah at least for me to keep up i mean it's partially partially like the internet too it's just like makes it so that like they're you're constantly putting out content uh whether it be through the channel through uh facebook fa- through tiktok mm. anything like you got content coming out it's just hard to follow in general and i think that like you said that's the same thing with most things star wars fucking way too much shit uh marvel too stuff much. too much shit star trek yeah star trek <laughs> trying to keep up with even star trek like 
you would think like Star Trek. Nah, there can't be that much stuff. No, there is. There's fucking too much stuff for Star Trek too. Well, because CBS realized Paramount realized they were sitting on that for way too long. Yeah, it's, like, a, it's a gold get, mine. Get ninety year old, you know, uh, Jean Luc Picard out there ASAP. We we need this. Yeah, yeah. but no wrestling. Wrestling's the same thing. Like if you're just looking at like uh, WWE now, you have Monday Night Raw. It's a three hour show. That's too fucking long. Then you have NXT. I think NXT is two hours now. That used to only, that used to be the developmental uh, sh- one of the developmental shows, and that used to only be an hour on the network. But now it's on USA. I think that's two hours long. SmackDown is on Friday night on Fox. That's two hours long. They have a pay per view every month, which is anywhere from between three and four hours long. If it's a big pay per view like WrestleMania, WrestleMania is two nights now. So that's eight, like eight hours, uh, like for that too. Now it's just like again, that's and that's just the WWE. It's a full time job to be, yeah. Just keep keeping yeah, track to, of it, just to watch it, yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah and that's that's how you how I've been feeling about a lot of things. Yeah, the the whole idea idea of more is better is really not the right move anymore. It's it's you're getting hit with too much content, and especially for people who are. OCD about it, keeping up with stuff like that. It's just uh it actually goes overboard and then you feel way too anxious about it and you're like, "Well, you know what? I'm just going to give up on all of it. Can't be bothered." But uh we're not here to talk about the actual sport of wrestling and what's going on in that world right now. We're we're here to talk about a movie about wrestling that you may have heard of. Um it's got uh, a familiar face in it. You might know him best from uh, High School Musical. But uh, I think I know him from um, the Netflix show that he was in where he did like uh, traveling around the world and like a little documentary. Sort of like, uh, um, what was that show? Uh, in Idiot Abroad. Except <laughs> uh, instead of, you know. Carl Pilkington. Carl Pilkington being himself and delightfully uh irreverent you have uh zach efron traipsing around d- various areas i think i think my wife watched that a couple times and i like happened to catch it on. i was like are you, are you watching like zach efron like travel places like <laughs> for one thing why <laughs> you know like i you know, not that i have anything against the guy um but i was just like it's a weird ch- decision to just be like yeah let's watch a travel show with zach efron I don't know. But uh, yeah, a movie star Zach Efron and uh, Z- Jeremy Allen White, who um, I'm very uh, keen on watching him in The Bear. I don't know. You've probably, have you ever seen The Bear? You never, you don't, you don't watch a whole lot of TV. And when you do, it's fucking wasted time spent watching stupid shit that I tell you not to do. I think that's me talking to you because I tell you about, uh, you know, watching, you know, struggling, struggle busting through season three of The Witcher or something, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but no, I have not seen The Bear, but I've seen clips from it. Uh, it's a great show. It's great. Yeah. You haven't seen the the Christmas episode with Jamie Lee Curtis. You're missing out. Mm-hmm. It's great. Um, yeah. Jeremy Allen White. Like him a lot. Um, Harris Dickinson. It's got in here. I'm not familiar with his work. A um, couple other people. And uh, I think it was na- it's, it's so it's significant. It's, it's an A twenty four movie. So I think in some ways you kind of know what you're getting into when you see A twenty four production um, strewn across the the title card because they have like a uh, they have a specific feeling to them, a specific uh, format formula, and it works. You know, as we've talked about a couple different A twenty four movies on here. We did Hereditary. We did Midsummer. Um, but like they they definitely have like this feel and and you know you're going to get a specific type of movie when you're watching them generally slow slower burn um so yeah what are we talking about i don't know <laughs> you can't remember yeah we <laughs> should uh, we should preface this by saying that uh we did see this movie in theaters um but we saw it a, almost a week ago so generally we don't wait that long to do an episode. I don't really know exactly why it just kind of fell in the time span of where we weren't going to be doing 
any recording. Uh, you had you were working. Um, yeah, we just didn't uh, didn't get a chance to do it for about oh, a week. So I know, silly me. Uh, Taylor Swift the Eras tour. That's right. Yeah, you know, if I have to hear any more about Taylor Swift the Eras tour and how fun it is to watch it, who's been saying that? My sister, <laughs> of course. <laughs> No, we're talking about the Iron Claw, which um came out I think at the tail end of 2023. Yes. And December. uh yeah, um, it's a really getting in there under the wire. And um we happened to see it in theaters uh just after that to 2024. Uh we're the only people there as well. Um it's always the best thing about going to a movie now. Absolutely. Go, Especially go, when we go at a weird time, like a, a Thursday matinee yeah, at four yeah. o'clock. It's like <laughs> You just know no one's going to, especially in our area, you just know. I mean, probably in bigger areas, people do go to movies at, you know, Thursday to four, stuff like that. But in our area, you just know when you're going to go there at that time. It's totally becoming like my favorite thing now. Like I just constantly, if I get bored, I will not hesitate to go to like a movie alone and just sit down and watch it by myself. (laughs) You'll be the only one there. Yeah, it's fine. Because you know what? It's great too. Because when we go up, you know, and buy a ticket and the guy that owns it, it's like... (laughs) yeah basically yeah <laughs> we're the only ones keeping the lights on in the but place. you know what they you know what one point against them they didn't have it formatted or right to the fucking the screen. Uh, screen because uh part of it was cut off which you know shame on you it's not like running a projector is a fucking hard thing these days it's not like there's an artwork to it it's a it's digit it's all digital all- <laughs> it's true it's true yeah there was uh let's see it was like cut off a little bit on top and bottom. So it's yeah. like kind of interesting. It was almost like the screen was just not slightly not big enough yeah. to sustain the image. Um, yeah, it's it, that's kind of what you get when you go to our small local theater. You know, it's it's uh, not like we're going to a Regal or something like that where it's kind of all oh. maintained. Um, Very. And you're spending $70 on chicken nuggets. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, at least you could tell, like, it wasn't like, it wasn't like egregious, where it was like, holy shit, what's happening? <laughs> you know, like, oh, it's, his head's halfway off screen. You could tell, but it was just like certain things, like writing, uh, like, le- letters on the on it would be cut off a little bit. I think there was at one point where it shows, like, it gives you, like, your, your location stamp, like, in Texas, and it's just like, it's just a little bit off, like, where you're missing, like, something in the corner. It's not terrible, but... A perfect movie going experience? No. Besides the fact that no one else was there. So that's that's definitely one of the perfect things about going to our theater. Um so yeah, I, I guess prefacing going into the Iron Claw, I didn't really know that much about it. Um I'm not a like I like I said, I did read WCW magazine a couple times. I watched WCW a little bit back in the nineties and uh early two thousands, but uh Which, not, that, say, that, that would also be the most you thing ever. Look, I even watched the wrestling. I just read the magazine every now yeah, and then. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I read about it. <laughs> yeah, I read about David uh, uh, David Arquette winning the world championship, you know, world heavyweight title. Oh, no. That would have been a lot later than I was uh, subscribed. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, I, I didn't really, never, never really followed wrestling all that much, though. And uh, definitely didn't know anything about the Von Erics, which this film is, you know. Solely centered around. Um, that's way too early for me. Like, I definitely had no context of that. Didn't uh, actually, I don't think I've ever even heard of them, to be honest with you, which is kind of surprising considering the legacy. Um, but really, I didn't know that much about it besides the fact that it was going to center around this family and uh, family of wrestlers. Um, but I'm sure you knew a, a lot more going into the Iron Claw and you've seen, you know, stories about the von erics and things like that yeah i'm you know not just a modern day wrestling fan i'm also you know know about the history of the territory days and stuff like that and that's why too like i i was asking you like halfway through like does any of the wrestling stuff make sense to you because like it's using a lot of you know kind of smart terminology like you know that i think that they're kind of expecting most people who are probably going to see this movie it was like well you know it's an a24 film it's going to be a little bit more, uh, you know, sophisticated. So we're expecting the people who are going to come and watch this film about the Von Erics are probably mainly going to be people who know about the Von Erics. It's not really somebody like it's not like outside of Zac Efron. No one's going to be sitting down like 
like with their family and be like, hey, kids, want to go see Iron Claw? What's that about? Oh, oh fucking wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think I think like um, I don't think it's that hard to get into from a, like a layman's perspective. There are probably things about it, though, that. I guess arguably maybe it doesn't do a great job of um, leading into, you know, about the wrestling world, cer- certain things like that. It, it kind of tries to give you a little back background about it, but uh, it doesn't do, you know, a lot of deep diving into like, this is the world. This is the, you know, this is what happens in wrestling land, things like that. Um, and it definitely doesn't go into, I think, like the... Uh, like the regional elements to it, the the league elements to it, like you, it doesn't really go into all of that scope. So it kind of just, you know, passingly mentions like here's the WWF and stuff like that. Uh, so you don't really get a whole lot of that from the movie either. But I think, you know, people who are going into it, even if you don't know about the Von Erics, it's still an enjoyable movie to to watch and get, you know, and to honestly as well, I can't really comment on how much they get right in this movie. Uh, in terms of the actual historical, um, you know, verity of what it is. Um, like, I guess we could talk about that as we get into it. Cause you probably know a little bit better than I do. Um, the significance of like, it, are they really true to the history? Did they capture everything that should have been captured, um, about the family, stuff like that. Um, that's kind of always the things that happen with the biopic too. It's like, what do you include? What do you not include? Um, you know, you can't have a whole running history of the family or else. Sure you can. Have you not seen Ray or walk the line? It's <laughs> like, they're like seven hours. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which I do love. Uh, I do love Ray. <clears throat> I think I've ever seen that one actually. You ever seen Ray starring Jamie Foxx as no. Ray Charles? Oh, I think my fam, my parents did, but I never ended up watching it. That's great. Yeah. And also, too, biopics are have been, like, before we get into our beer, they have been, like, making a big comeback, like, especially, like, the music ones, too. Sure. Like, every year now, like, here's our queen one, Bohemian Rhapsody. I know, let's do Elton John, you know, and they even did, like, a Weird Al one, you know, yeah. as, like, a, as a joke. Mm-hmm. But, you know, they're all, so. Yeah, I mean, they are huge. And, you know, they're also like a good Oscar bait, too, to be honest oh, with yeah. you. Um, you know, they, you call out the fact that this is, you know, a biography and what? what? Get them on the ballot. Um, so. Well, this I movie, like, let's say this movie's uh, destined for Oscar bait just because it's like, how many people die? <laughs> <laughs> Get, get, get it up there. That's the whole reason Crash won. It's true. All right, let's talk about the beer, or I guess we should say the not beer that we have on the show today. Um, I'll let you take it away because you're you know you're kind of the the pioneer of this one for this month. Um, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? What have you? Oh, were you asking a question? I was going to grab another. Oh, yeah, yeah. I said, I said, I'll let you take it. I'll t- <laughs> <laughs> I let you take it away. Why are we doing? What are we doing? What beer are we doing? Or not beer are we doing? Why are we doing it? What's going on with it? Well, it's because we're old, and we're giving up. We're giving up the drink. Ah, uh, no, man. It's dry January, so we're gonna humor ourselves. Well, at least I am. Um. Yeah, not drink for the month. I don't know how you've been doing. Oh, I yeah, I failed it. Like on okay. the first day, I drank on January first. I, so I didn't. I, so did I. That's why mine started a week ago. Ah, okay. So it's gonna run into February. So but, yours, you know. yeah, yours is going a a little bit over. But yeah, I mean, I I I like the idea of dry January in in certain elements to it. Um, like actually, like I had already announced previously, like um a couple episodes ago. That I was cutting back a lot on beer, um, at least during my, you know, like during my normal weekdays. Um, during the weekends, I will still drink. I will still have beer. Um, I've been cutting back just like on the normal weekdays where I would normally come home and or no, I don't really come home. I work from home. So but I would get off of work and I would <laughs> I would just crack a beer and I would have one beer and basically a night. 
Um, but I, I kind of wanted to cut that out a little bit, stop drinking or feeling the need to drink every single night. So I've been cutting back quite a bit and um, that's I kind of counted that towards my dry January. So I didn't really set out doing a dry January specifically, but it just in general, I've been drinking less. Um, but for you, you have decided that instead of drinking a beer, you know, which would again be like your normal, probably like daily occurrence, um, you're going to go the non-alcoholic route and drink the NA beers, which every now and then, because they're too damn expensive. It's true. It's true. Um, I, we've never had an NA beer on here. Um, we've talked about, I think some of them before, but, um, We've never really had the occasion to. And like you said, part of it is because of the price. Because the, I guess what you would call the quote unquote good NA beers, um, they have to be brewed like a beer, brew the whole, you know, brew the whole thing and then siphon out the alcohol. It's expensive to make that. So what you're left with as a consumer is you're buying an expensive, you know, basically beer priced non-alcoholic beer and i guess for me that's always been the off-putting thing is like i'm spending i'm already spending what like 12 dollars on a six pack that and i could be spending that just getting an actual beer and it's it's a little bit off-putting to have to stomach the cost of that um and eat it and i i get i totally understand it i understand from the brewing perspective it's still expensive to get all of the ingredients together to go through the whole process and actually add an additional process of taking out the alcohol. But still it's, it's hard when you're in the store and you're like, Oh, that's a, you know, it's an expensive proposition to be getting a non-alcoholic beer. Um, so the one that we have on the show today though, is from athletic brewing company. Um, so you've probably heard of athletic. They've made a really big push, um, commercially. And I think it's not just here, but everywhere they've, I think they've really pushed into like all the major supermarkets that, you know, have beer and major stores and things like that, which you don't really see a lot from non-alcoholic brewers. Like you'll see now a lot of, a lot more people are brewing non-alcoholic beverages, but they're harder to come by. It's not like you can just walk into your local grocery store and be like, yeah, you got that new Sierra Nevada non-alcoholic, like generally not. (laughs) It's just not a, and part of that is cost as well. Like the, the shops aren't, are like, well, that's probably not going to sell that well. You know, I'm not going to, not going to get a whole case of it to have it sit there, uh, and go bad. So, um, they're really, they're not as easy to come by, but athletic has been doing a lot of them. And they basically are one of the leaders in making varietal styles of non-alcoholic beer, which is not something that you normally see because Normally you'll see like Heineken makes Heineken, but it has 0% alcohol or Guinness makes a Guinness zero. You know, they make their same style, but they make it without alcohol. Athletic does all different kinds of styles. Um, And today we've got Wits Peak, which from the name you could tell it's a Belgian style wit. So what do you think about the wit? How do you feel? It's pretty good. Um... It's definitely got like your coriander notes. It's definitely got your orange peel notes. Nice zestiness. Has even a little bit of like a Belgian style, uh, I guess skunk, but it's not really skunk, but like, you know, kind of a uh, aftertaste, like back end taste mm-hmm. to it. Like the um, wordy. Yeah. yeah the yeah, Belgian yeah. wordy taste. Yeah. Mm hmm. But it's, you know, pa- obviously pared down because it's an NA, so it's, you know, pretty pretty uh, watery. But it's not bad at all. Actually, I'm pretty impressed with it, like them attempting this uh, and doing it as successfully. It is pretty good. Again, though, the biggest har- thing that I will harp on it is the, just the fact that for a six pack of these things, it's just not worth it. You're better off just buying a fucking six pack of Blue Moon. It's probably just as healthy for you too, outside of the fucking uh, the alcohol count, because uh, this is uh, sixty calories of beer and it's got twelve grams of carbs in it, 
which is, you know, nothing but sugar. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, so I guess I'll I'll start off with how I feel about it. So I think it's, you know, it's it's pretty good. And I think I've had two athletics now. I think I've had their standard IPA and then I've had this one, the Wits Peak. Um, I think every time, like every time I've had it, I've thought it's pretty good. So it's not like it's not going to, it's not blowing you away, but you're also kind of like, I think your expectations are already down a little bit. You're like, well, it's going to be non-alcoholic. So, um, it's obviously not going to be exactly the same as the alcoholic style. Um, so I think they, they've done a pretty good approximation of a wit here. Um, like the immediate taste to it is definitely, you get that coriander element, the spice element to it. You get, a, a touch of that like malted barley. Um, and then what ends up happening, and I, I feel like this is the same with the other non-alcoholic beer that I had. Um, once you really get that mouthfeel in, um, it, it definitely turns into more of like that wateriness where it immediately loses some of its flavor. And by the time you're swallowing and you get that like aftertaste, you're really kind of getting, it's mostly just like liquid at that point. It doesn't really end up tasting all, a lot like the beer anymore. So it does have that watery element to it. It's very light. Um, it definitely doesn't have the same impact mouthfeel wise as, as like a normal beer would, but it does a pretty good job. And then the one thing I would say about non-alcoholic beers to me is that they, they are such an approximation without actually coming, without hitting it on the head that you, it kind of makes you feel like, well, I wish I was just having the actual beer. Um, and so I feel like as a replacement for it's like lost limb syndrome. Like you're like, <laughs> it's like yeah. oh, I feel it there, but it's it's not not quite there. Y- yeah, and I feel like like if I was truly like if I was an alcoholic or something, and I was trying to kick that urge to have a beer, I don't think a a non alcoholic beer would be a good thing because I feel like it would actually make you more likely to go back to drinking a regular beer because you'd like you'd taste it. You'd be like, this tastes sort of like it, but it doesn't really hit that spot. And so you'd be like, I just got to get the real thing. Um, so it is interesting. I, I like, I like the idea of non-alcoholic beers. I do think that some are better than others at meeting the need of a non-alcoholic beer. Like for me specifically, why I'm not drinking beer is because I'm trying to cut down on like those extra calories, those extra carbs. Um, and in this case, particularly 60 calories with that much amount of carbs is really not doing me that many favors, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, uh, cause like you, if you're trying to cut, which back, is kind of, which is kind of a miracle too. If you think about it, it's like, wow, only 60 calories. And it's like, how do you get that much sugar in there? If it's only 60 calories. Yeah. It, like if you think about it too, like I think a normal 12 ounce it's going to have about 120 to 150 calories. So it does, it does cut down like half of the calories. But I know like for me, if I was to have um, a non-alcoholic, I probably would drink more of them at a sitting. And so it probably ends up being a wash as to, you know, what I actually ended up intaking. Because if I'm going to have more non-alcoholics, I'm eventually going to meet the same amount as if I just had one actual beer a night. So. I don't know. I'm conflicted as to whether I think that this would actually work as in terms of like switching over to just non-alcoholic beer, but I think Athletics done a pretty good job with their approximation of a I think I think like yeah, no, I, I agree. I think it will I, for at least for me, I think when I've, you know, done like uh dry months, it like every like couple of weeks it's good to like kind of slip though like a six pack in to like kind of sparse out cuz it's like, oh, Okay. Like if you're like going to stop drinking and then you're going to like just fill these in, it's not going to do it. You have like, you have to like kind of fit it in, you know, every now and then. Otherwise it definitely loses its luster. Yeah. Yeah. But I I think like there's enough styles from athletic. You could really, if the variety is the thing that you need, um, it definitely allows you to, experience it without you know feeling like you're missing out um i think some of them too not all of them but some of them are actually gluten-free too so if you're like you know craving the gluten-free beer um some some of them will hit that mark too um 
So yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting, I, like, it's definitely something that's been more of a proliferation. And if you saw in January, I think I I saw at least two or three different breweries that were like marketing dry January. Um, hey, you're doing dry January? No problem. We got a non-alcoholic for you. Um, <clears throat> it's it's. I guess it's you know it's kind of it's kind of becoming a thing. Just like hop water. Hop water is a big thing too. Um, you know, replacing that IPA <laughs> with some hop water. Um, <laughs> your new seltzer. You're, your Poland spring po- uh, Poland springs been sitting very oh so closely to a, bu- a barrel of <laughs> Citra and Simcoe hops. <laughs> One or two of the the little heads might have fallen in there into your Poland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I would definitely like check out Athletic. They've got a lot of different styles. This wit is pretty good. Um, you know, it could be your thing. And a, a lot of people, you know, used to laugh about non-alcoholic beers. Just be like, oh, duels. Why would I buy all duels? But as you get older, you can kind of see there is a, so, some appeal to it, um, to cutting out. Especially if you're like, a, if you've gotten it to be a habit, it can it can help. So, uh, Especially now that the, uh, we are alcoholics now because um, the... Uh, what is it? The standard for that now is just looking at two beers a, a week, like uh, seeing them in store. Yeah, like yeah. You, they you say, just, they say you, if you, you make eye, if you make eye contact, it's it's becoming like it's like if you have lust in your heart, you might as well you, you have it. It's imperative <laughs> that you skip the beer aisle when you're shot in the grocery store. You can't you can't even shop at stores that sell it. You got you got to find clean, virginal stores. Well, we had Aldi, but not anymore. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. All the, yeah, all these, uh, branched out. And now, yeah, they're, now they're beckoning to me. They're like, Hey, we got five 99 tall boy four packs. You can't pass it up. If you're in all the, you're having to buy a a pack of beer now. It's just that cheap. Is it really five 99 for a four pack? Yeah. yeah, Of of that, like, uh, you know, that, um, knockoff. Yeah. Oh God! Now I'm gonna really have. To I know. Yeah, if you go in, in there, you just stop by. You're like five, five, five dollars. <laughs> All right. I mean, you're basically forcing my hand here. <laughs> Listen, it's kind of like when we're at Stewart's with the Mountain Brew beer ice. <laughs> right. <stuff>. Yeah. <laughs> Three ninety nine a six pack. And it's like, but that was bad, bad. So like you could, you know. Which I almost wish they'd bring that back to see how it is now. Like you know, fifteen years later, like you know, has Panther pissed aged. <laughs> uh. all right let's talk about the iron claw um the iron claw. so this movie centers around the von erics right and uh they're a group of siblings family of wrestlers the movie starts out with a nice black and white look back period in the 70s um where it follows uh the patriarch of the von eric family um, played by Holt McCallany. Um Fritz, his name is. And uh you uh didn't watch Mindhunter, right? The the show by uh No that was on Netflix. But uh I did. I watched uh Mindhunter and, and Holt McCallany, he's a he's a big part of that. And it is a comforting to see him in this movie because I was like, ah, I like that guy, you know. It's, it's fun, always fun to see somebody who doesn't do a whole like a whole lot of acting or haven't seen him in a lot of roles see him come back here. But um yeah, it shows Fritz. Say it's in the beginning of the movie. You see how motivated Fritz is to you become a wrestler, to actually become someone, to win the title, um, and then it it jumps forward and you see now he's got a uh, a ranch full of kids, basically. You know, all of his kids: Kevin, Carrie, David. Uh, what am I missing? Mike. Yeah, they are Kevin, Kevin Carrie, Mike, and uh... David. David, yeah. They are uh, they're all to some degree wrestlers, except Carrie at the beginning. Um, we don't actually really see Car- much of Carrie. They they give a they show a, a photograph, family photograph of him on the wall, but you don't really get to see him till later on in the film. Uh and you know, kind of explaining the reasons why. Because <clears throat> uh Car- Carrie was on the nineteen eighty uh summer Olympic team. Yeah. Not destined for good things that that year, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Um so they're all wrestling to some degree. Kevin being like the main attraction, main star, main attraction right now. 
And uh, what league are they in for the uh, for wrestling? Oh, uh, what, what, what? Not league. It's uh, it's yeah. It's like a regional territory. Yeah, Wrestle, wrestling then was uh, territories. Uh, the World Class Championship Wrestling (WCCW) was his uh, father's promotion, specifically in Texas. Yeah. The, so basically, um, around this you know time period, uh, wrestling across the country was uh, divvied up by t- uh, territories. Each you know promoter kind of had their own section of states that they controlled and ran shows at. <clears throat> and basically, for the most part, not all, but a lot of the promoters uh were part of the nwa the national wrestling alliance it's the big governing board that uh and that's where they would make the decisions like who would be world champ and you know make their kind of decisions and they'd loan out talent from you know territory to territory you know like they do like a stint that like you know they'd be like hey we want you know andre the giant you know for a couple of you know a couple of months run out here in California, can you send them over? Yeah, you know, while you give us this talent to, you know, do a couple of shows and so on and so forth. So, yeah. And, and so basically, they're, you know, mm. all of the kids, mostly Kevin and um, uh, David. David, are involved in this wrestling scene for Fritz. And he's, you know, like you said, he it's his, mm. it's his um, promotion. Ba- like promotion. Yeah. So, what when we meet them basically they're all very motivated and i think like at the beginning of the iron claw is a really great uh time in the movie um from Sean Durkin because you know as a writer and director he is really showing you at the beginning of this movie like how close the brothers are what kind of familial life they have um how the the camaraderie between them is um and even after you know like we start to see certain elements to it like Right at the beginning, too, we do hear like how Fritz like names in the order of importance his sons, <laughs> you know, and how he, <laughs> you know, how he feels like. Well, my favorite right now is Kevin, and then and it goes David and Carrie, and and then you, Mike. But you can you can work your way up, you know. There's always a chance to to come back up. So you start to see those like that family dynamic of like what's going on, and you kind of at that moment in in the beginning, you're like kind of jokey, like oh, he's probably joking about that, right? Like that's just a funny thing dads say sometimes. But um, you you start to see that camaraderie between them, and I think that it does a really good job of showcasing that camaraderie of between brothers, and um, and also showing too the nightmare that the Von Erich's mother probably went through day to day by trying to fucking feed this household of ranch hands slash wrestlers. Um, like at the beginning too, when you see she's like just. She just literally keeps coming back to the the breakfast table with like fucking like here's here's some egg McMuffins and here's some eggs just, here's some, like a whole giant bowl ham, of like thirty six eggs ham steaks corn fritters yeah <laughs> it's fucking hilarious it's like this woman's Boat, just trying to keep Boat, up Boat, here Boda gravy that well that's why all she does is spend her time making food and praying like and they got like two different fridges in there and not actually mothering because she doesn't do it you know the film does not depict her you know well she's just like. That's between you and your brother. That's mm-hmm. between you and your father. Like, mm-hmm. you know. it would be pretty funny if they saw if they showed like a, a fucking like delivery truck keep pulling up like a whole big you know freighter of like just food. It's like here's your delivery. <laughs> it's normally going to the grocery store, but <laughs> here you go. Freights of eggs just being offloaded yeah. and and like gallons of milk. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Just th- thinking about the upkeep is is pretty crazy, but um, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I like the camaraderie at the beginning, and then even when um, Carrie Jeremy Jeremy Allen White's character comes home, um, you know, after he's been, you know, like pretty devastated by not being able to um, compete in the 1980 Olympics, uh, he's a discus thrower, and um, basically, you can sum that up as he hucks a heavy object very far. You know, I've always liked the idea of discus. It's just like, who came up with that? It's like, just the fucking... Freaks. I know, it's it's just funny, though. It's like, let's just throw this really fucking heavy rock as far as we can. And you would think in discus, there's got to be a limit. Like, a literal, like, physical limit to, like, where that can end up, right? Like, I guess most Olympic sports, too, have, like, a physical limit. It's like, can it go any further than you hucking it? 
I don't even know what the record is from Viscous, but like, can you huck it that much further? I don't know. Well, and also too, because I think it's uh, pretty far out. I don't think a lot of people remember the reason why the uh, Carrie Von Eric didn't go to the 80 Olympics was because uh, the Jimmy Carter started a boycott and didn't want to uh, send the U.S. over to participate because it was in uh, Moscow. Right. And, and the film does go into that. It has like a whole. Um, <laughs> to get the the story, yeah. 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 But I think that's like something that's like so far off down the distance. I don't think people even really you know, realize that now. Yeah, I mean, I definitely wouldn't have thought of, thought of it at the time if they had just showed like, oh, he can't participate in the Olympics. I probably wouldn't have thought anything of it. Um, but yeah, the, the the film does kind of go into that. And when he comes home, you know, he's he's obviously devastated, but like immediately you see all of his brothers kind of like jump on him and be like, hey, it's great to see you. And um, like again, that camaraderie the, that the film showcases is really nice, especially because at the beginning of the movie. I would say that Iron Claw um, is pretty slow moving in terms of, you know, like getting a lot of plot together. Most of what you're seeing is, you know, characterization, uh, meeting the Von Erics, seeing like their day to day, the things that they do, um, training and things like that. Montages. Um, I think uh, also you get to see like um, Mike do his, you know, like do his own thing because he's one of the guys that really isn't really into wrestling. He's kind of a scrawny guy. He, you know, he like he loves music. He basically plays all of these different instruments and um loves there's, his Tom loves his Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Absolutely. There's yeah. a you know, there's a nice scene Re- where I say, really love that he had a hard promises uh poster on his wall. Yeah, right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um so you kind of you kind of get those elements at the beginning, but I would say, and I don't know if you agree, the the, the opening and probably I would say the first first act. Um, maybe even into the second is a is a bit slow and it does take some time to get itself moving and see where all of this is heading towards what, what did you think about that because i mean obviously too from your perspective you already know where the movie is most likely heading like you you know it's it's you don't know exactly how it's going to divulge the details throughout and in, in a narrative perspective but you know where it's going you know what you know the tragedies are going about to unfold so what, would, what did you think about that I was hoping when they were rafting down the lazy river and you hear Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers don't do me like that playing and everyone's like, hi, Kevin, hi, Carrie, as they're drinking beers on their lazy river, that Jason was going to jump out and take, you know, that's how the Von Erichs died. They died, <laughs> yeah. at Camp, they died at Camp Crystal Lake as they were, you know, lazily rafting down the river. <laughs> um, It's all right. I think, um, no, you're definitely right. It is slow because I did think I did think going in because I did see a couple of trailers and stuff and them uh, like a couple of like the promo vids like I was at work and had YouTube play in the background and constantly getting ads for it and hearing them talk about Chavo Guerrero Jr. Uh, you know, training them for the wrestling and the work that they put in for it that there I was thinking there'd be more wrestling in the film than there actually was because uh, there's not a lot, you know, it, it takes like what half an hour in this two hour movie to get to any like actual wrestling wrestling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I mean, that was a little bit of a disappointment, but I mean, I was fine with like the, you know, the slow beats and slow burn. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, I I think it works for the film. I think it's, it's one of those things though, where if you're expecting something different, like if you're expecting a lot more wrestling to, to have a focus beyond, some more wrestling and showing like the competitions that they've been in. Um, you might be disappointed in that it doesn't have as much at the be- at the beginning. And even se- even then, you know, uh, it does have a lot of kind of exposition to get through and not saying that that's a bad thing or developing, developing the family itself is not a bad thing. It's just something that you kind of have to get through um, to get to the meatier parts of the movie, the real, you know, events that take place in this family's life. And um, I think it does a good job with that, um, you know, showcasing all these disparate elements of each of the family members interests and how they kind of all divulge, di- I'm sorry, not divulge, diverge into wrestling. And a- at the head of that is Fritz, who's kind of, um, you know, I would say he's kind of, I, and I don't know anything about the real life person, but certainly in this movie, 
Fritz as a father figure, as a person, is very demonized um, in terms of being one of the pivotal roles of uh, the tragedies that occur, right? Like, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to say they're placing all the blame, but it's certainly the movie does put a lot of blame on Fritz as a person who has kind of driven his family into obsessing over wrestling as a sport and as a, like a family namesake. Um, and do, I mean, do you know more about the history of that? Is that like, is, is the film kind of, is it trying to lay blame and uh, have a scapegoat or is the, is that truly historically accurate to the family? Is it, you know, what have, do you know anything about that? Um, well, well, I think the little that I do know, I, I think, um, yeah, uh, Fritz was kind of a son of a bitch, mm -hmm. not like, you know, a son of a bitch by being like a complete asshole, but being very demanding and, you know, uh, having unrealistic expectations, you sure. know. Sure. For his kids. You know, and the movie goes into that quite a bit. And, you know, it does also touch on some other things. Obviously, you know, Carrie had some drug issues. Um, they all did. Not not every single Von Eric yeah, had drugs. Sure. Drug, <laughs> I don't I don't drug. think the film focuses on that as much. It, it more so on Carrie specifically, you know, because you get those ver variety of shots of him, you know, stiffen various drugs, prescription drugs, mm -hmm. cocaine all of that they don't really go into the others as much um and i guess that's kind of a, one of those areas of iron claw and any movie that's sort of a biography where you can kind of draw you it kind of makes you think it's like well this is someone's history but it's someone's perspective of that history so that's why you know i kind of question you know the, the film really does demonize fritz as a as the main pivotal point and and the issues that the family faced besides like the idea of the von Erich curse but we're getting someone's perspective of that history and so it's it's interesting to think about that it, you know it's not truly the truth there is no real truth it's just a perspective on the truth um so i guess what do you think about the film's um portrayal of like the the lead up with the wrestling because it does have like you said there's not a lot of wrestling but there is uh various matches do they do a good job um recreating those matches uh how it would have looked back in the 80s and what you've seen from the you know from from video clips and things like that i do like that the like the stylized like world class segment bits that they do uh you know with a couple of things you know um with some of the promos you know they have Harley races in here uh, and the guy that plays Harley, uh, Kevin Anton, does a really good job. It was like uh, portraying what Harley Race looked and sounded like back in like 1980. You know, just a gruff, big, son burly son of a bitch. Uh, the Ric Flair promo, and we'll get to that a little later when we get more into that. Not great at all. Easily the worst part of the film. Mm -hmm. But... Like the like yeah like the like kind of like the aesthetics and stuff they do well but like I said though like for the most part like a lot of that's kind of just there and glossed over like the whole you know like uh, one of their big breaks and big matches against the fabulous Freebirds is like a just a forty five second clip of like the Freebirds just running out and then like oh they drop kick them together oh <laughs> and then like you know and then it's like hey the Von Erichs are your new NWA six uh six man tag like champions and it's like okay and that that that's it you know um but yeah like i think the wrestling for the most part in this film you know it's portrayed pretty well but i like i said i think it's uh you know it's definitely an afterthought in the film like it's it's a um, a means to an end you know they're not trying to show the beauty and grace of the sport they're you know, it's just trying to show, oh, yeah, they had some important matches along the way because they're wrestlers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, first and foremost, this is not a movie about wrestling. It's about wrestlers and the family dynamic of that. And I think, you know, in large part, that's where some of the um, 
the interest comes from from people who are not interested in wrestling. You know, it's it's got that sort of prestige element to it of, you know, it's about family, it's about this about family drama. I know that's why my wife wanted to see it. it. Wasn't because it was about wrestling or wrestlers, uh, but more so because she likes dysfunctional families. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it kind of has that um that interest going for it. And uh I think it does that fairly well. Um and like we were talking about, you know, the opening moments showing that camaraderie between the the brothers later on when you start to see you know sort of those edges curl in on themselves where um obviously like kevin's uh non-successful about um or carrie starting to take on um you know some of more of the wrestling gigs uh or you know david taking on a lot of the wrestling gigs and actually going to japan um to compete those types of things kind of drive a wedge into the family and you start to see like those wedges start to get at people. And most specifically the film is its main focus is on Kevin. Um, Cause Kevin is the, you know, the film shows, and I don't know how, again, I don't know how accurate this truly is to real life, but the film showcases Kevin as being the one that basically sees the, the, the start of all of his brother's tragedies. Um, you know, first off, he sees David throwing up blood and he's like, man, you should get that looked at, <laughs> you know? And so there's that idea that like, he's always, he's, you know, he's always there. He's seeing this happen and he can't prevent these tragedies from occurring. Um, no matter how hard he tries or, um, you know, maybe the lack thereof, just not the knowledge to know. So the, the film kind of goes into that and you start to see that, that wedge driven in the family. And there's a great shot later on as uh, I think it's after David has um, died from uh, an intestinal uh, uh, rupture, um, and which uh, uh, more than likely that was probably from uh, painkiller overdose. Oh yeah, yeah. And the film doesn't really go into that either. I mean, no, 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 no. They've claimed the family's claimed for years that it was a ruptured intestines, but uh, in Ric Flair's book, they said he said they were Bruiser Brody was flushing pills down the toilet so he wouldn't get caught mm -hmm. with pills right uh, but i think it's just after that scene where you see you see them now they're back at the you know the ranch house and what once was them you know loud at the din at dinner table you know eating and talking is now just like carrie sitting silently sullenly you know kevin sitting silently to himself mike just sitting there everybody's you know kind of quieted down and there's like that whole you know element of you know sadness in the house now um which i think is really good it's shown showcased very well um and the film does a good job of kind of dealing with that tragedy and uh i guess that's now is a good time to bring up the fact that the film doesn't have chris von eric in it um because he also died of suicide and was a, another Von Eric brother. And uh, the film kind of uh, omits him from like even being a part of the family. It doesn't even make mention of him. Um, it even mentions, you know, Kevin, who the uh, not Kevin. I mean, um, uh, what's his brother? What's the young brother's name? Um, Mike. Mike. No, not Mike. Um, oh, the one that died. Yeah, uh, the one that. Yeah, the one that died um, as a kid. He uh, got electrocuted. Uh, I can't remember his name, but he, uh, I think, uh, can't remember his name, but he got electrocuted and fell into a puddle of snow and drowned, which is like kind of like the most eyeball way. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. As, gr as grim as it is to say, which I mean, that's, you know, truly how the poor six, <laughs> eight, six year old died. But yeah. But uh, I mean, they even, they even go, oh, Jack, Jack Jr. is his name. Yeah. Um, they even go into that, but they don't mention Chris and, um, you know, they've stated that it's because, you know, the film already has enough tragedies. Um, but I was just, I thought it kind of interesting because like, what's more and more suicide in this movie with two suicides already in it, you know, <laughs> it's maybe it's just that there's also not enough time to kind of go into another Von Eric. Um, what do you, what do you think about that? It's fine. Like, I I do kind of agree. I think you know, 
probably would have been a little too much. I mean, the film's already two hours long and mm-hmm. there's already so much, you know, tragedy and basically does, you know, fit the same beats of, you know, his brother Mike. So I, for the privacy's sake, uh, for a film, yeah, I mean, it's fine. Especially seeing as they kind of admitted, I mean, not admitted, but kind of combined uh, Mike and Chris's stories into one. So, and the fact that, you know, people who know the story of the Von Eriks, you know, are going to point that out to people. So, I mean, it's not like anything uh, that's going to get lost to time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you t- we touched on this a little bit. What, so, you know, Rick Flair is obviously in this movie. Um, how do you feel about that impression? Fucking terrible. It's one, like one of the worst things of all time. It's kind it's, of ju- it's jarringly bad. Yeah, it's kind like, of interesting that there wasn't anybody that could do a Ric Flair impression better. I, I and that's I guess it's no, you know, I don't really know the actor who plays Ric Flair, Aaron Dean Eisenberg, but like you just have to kind of think, you know, especially when you compare the two, like the impression is really not even close. And I don't know. It's like you said, it's jarring. It's, you know, when you, th- when you think about it and how actually how close, like all of them really appear to the actual Von Eriks. Um, Except Jeremy Allen White's like a foot shorter than what Carrie Von Eric is. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, like you, it's just weird how Ric Flair's portrayal. Well, also, I'll say also too, cause it's Rick fucking Flair for God's sakes. It's like, he's right up there with, you know, the rock Hulk Hogan, you know, Steve yeah, Austin. I would, I would say like, even people who don't know that much about wrestling, they may, they may know Ric Flair. So that's one of those impressions that you kind of want to get right in this movie. And it, it really falls far from uh, from hitting that, especially when you watch like the because they do. They try to recreate some of the interviews that they've done. Promotion. Yeah. And when you watch the real one, it's not even close. Um. Which makes you think too, like why sometimes did they even that's, bother that's, to recreate? That's where them? that's where the money ran out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they they were doing everything else fine, and they're like, oh fuck, we don't have money to get a fla- uh, good Flair. Uh, they probably could have paid Flair fucking dollar, and he would have showed up and just like, you know, done it himself at like you know the ripe age of like seventy four. Woo! <laughs> yeah. Don't even get the woo right. No. He's like more like, wow. Like Owen Wilson. What why is it Owen Wilson doing it? Yeah. Or or you know what? Will Farrell, you know, from Eastbound and Down. Like, oh, look at my plums. <laughs> I my, yeah, my juicy plums. Feel those plums. So, um how do you feel about the uh the Kevin romance that the film goes into you know because obviously a big part of it is his family life isn't it lovely he loves his brother so much he doesn't know how to talk to ladies (laughs) yeah and he loves his brother so much with that mountain of a man she makes him a man that's right Uh uh-huh It's fine. You know what I was giving out about a little bit to myself, though, when they're at the, having their barbecue date, you know, delightful. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's like, oh, isn't it fake or whatever? And he's like explaining to her like, no, it's not fake. It's real. But, you know, well, we do, you know, this and this happens and stuff. And it's like that would never happen. Like, especially like if she wasn't married or like to him or something like he wouldn't like. Because back then, wrestlers were incredibly productive of the business. It's, uh, you know, that's why, uh, uh, what the hell? Uh, I can't remember his goddamn name. But, like, they were, uh, you know, uh, very protective of the business. They don't, like, you know, they wouldn't expose secrets. Like, you know, at the end of the, like, of the movie, when you see Ric Flair, like, come into, like, the locker room and talk to Kevin Von Eric, and, you know, like, oh, that was a great match. You know, we should do it again. Back then, like, the heels and the faces had their own locker rooms. They wouldn't be seen, like, talking together because, you know, to keep the illusion that everything they're doing is real. 
So he wouldn't be like on his first date with some girl being like, oh, yeah, if, you know, if I do it right, the NWA uh, uh, bookers might think I'm good enough to, like, you know, give me a world title match if, you know, I win enough around here and stuff. And, you know, he wouldn't be like talking about the business at all like that. He'd be like, oh, you don't need to know about that. So, yeah, I was, yeah, I, I was, it's, it's, I was keep those was secrets was, close yeah. to the vest. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of divulging them to the first woman yeah. that you're meeting. Yeah. Uh, before they even realize if they're going to have a relationship or not. She got nice boobies. She goes back and tells everybody about it. And there it goes. This is how he does the iron claw. It's a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. 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 But Um, yeah. I also too like, I also too like when they show the sportatorium and everyone's partying and lining up and stuff down in Dallas. Cause I mean, that's one thing I'll kind of say that the film, because it doesn't like have like these big matches and kind of the e- energy to go with it, like to show the wrestling, it does take away from like the Von Erics were a big fucking deal in the 80s, especially down in Texas and down in like South in WCCW and like, a, you know, regional promotions like Georgia Championship Wrestling and Mid South and et cetera. Like, they were a big fucking deal. Like if you watch, like, the videos of the matches that they were doing back then, sold out, people screaming, throwing shit into the rings, like, you know, fainting over each other. They were big shit. <laughs> and I think the fact that because the film... Excuse me. I'm in a little indigestion there. Because the film does have these, like, small, intimate, you know... Very like feels like it was uh, the wrestling matches were shot kind of in like high school because you go like the lighting kind of just shows a bit of the like, you know, because obviously they weren't going to get like a billion, you know, people to. uh, Fill in as extras in like these, you know, places, so it's like more, you know, intimate looking, you know, even in like intimate settings, the places would have been rocking like, you know, and. Ben, like wow, this is a big goddamn, you know, big thing that's going on, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that the film showcasing um, the idea of, like, I, I don't know, the, I, I, I guess I, I like the idea of them um, showing all of, like, the family dynamic. I do think that it does need a little bit more of a call to attention of, like, the... I guess the 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 fame that they already had because it it show it, it almost kind of makes it seem like you're like a local like a local hero right like you you know you've been battling it out in like your local YMCA wrestling match kind of and and like like you said a lot bigger than that um it doesn't really go into that that well so um but speaking back about the you know Kevin's family with Pam you know there's the obvious idea that kevin is trying to be a different person than his dad uh for his for his kids um and ultimately kind of uh accidentally does a similar thing by being kind of absent for a lot of his uh son's early life because he's afraid that he's going to pass on his curse the the von eric curse to his family um especially after multiple tragedies have occurred but i think that it, the film does a really good job of kind of showing the disparity between the two families. You know, you have a family who is obviously um, very close knit, but that's because Fritz's uh, relationship with them in, like, almost enforces it to be close knit because you have to have, you know, there's, it's almost a competition in the Von Eric family to be the better brother, even though, you know, everybody's very good to each other and, you know, jealousy is not that, um, you know, it, jealousy is not really not as uh, apparent in the in the dynamic. There's still that element of, you know, trying to become dad's favorite. And, you know, on the flip side, you have Kevin's family who later on at the end of the movie, you kind of see him try to be that different kind of dad who's crying in front of his kids. And even though he you know kind of talks about how it's not manly to cry. Um, and that quote he says, too, is uh, actual Kevin Von Eric quote. He said, you know. He has said before, you know, I used to be a brother, you know, an older brother. Now I'm not even a brother anymore. I mean, it's it's a great end to the movie. I think it's really um, it's like 
whether that's the exact quote or not, it's it really is an effective um, end to the movie because you have the whole dynamic of and honestly too, think about this. The, they must have fucking men in the genetics because they got fucking what five or six brothers, and then the Von Erichs go on to have like I don't even know how many, two at least two more sons. They got men in the genetics, but anyway. Well, I was to say in, in, in the film when they show, uh, you know, his uh, sons, he did have a daughter too. Which yeah, but know. we forget about her. Like, it's not- <laughs> Um, women, women folk. Yeah, but I, like it's a really effective way to end the movie. I think you know if you're gonna end the movie at any point in time, right there is probably the way to go. Um, I like it a lot. I like the ending. I think that it it does a good job of trying to say like, here's what we're gonna do different. You know, because obviously something in that family was not working. <laughs> you know, uh, whether it be fame, whether it be uh dad you know something really went haywire uh to have you know th- three people in the family commit suicide well again mom wasn't great either because at least in this film the way she's you know portrayed is because you know she's just like just leave me alone yeah i mean i think part of the way that she's portrayed too is um showing how wrestling kind of seeped into their life and like sort of took over like expanded to be literally everything because we do get that scene where you know it shows her where they're looking at the painting mike's looking at the painting that she she did and she's like yeah Yeah. i did that but you didn't even know that right because it's it's almost saying like these were my interests prior yeah yeah, these were my interests prior to wrestling and it all became you know the secondary thing um that i never got to do and then at the end of the movie we see her start painting again because she's got nothing left yeah exactly like she i mean it's her taking back the things that she wanted to do rather than being forced into doing something specific you know um so real quick to kind of go through the uh the morgue we talked about you know jack jr not shown in the film but uh well he's shown in heaven yeah in a dream sequence right yeah, gets 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 electrocuted and then falls into a puddle and drowns. Uh, David died in Japan of uh, intestinal rupture, which is probably due to drugs. Because again, what twenty four year old is having their intestine just rupture in Japan? Uh, Michael commits suicide after with uh, pills, and Carrie shoots himself in the head. Also, too, one thing that the film kind of makes seems like uh, happened, which didn't happen. Carrie does lose his leg in a motorcycle accident, but it is not right after he, well, not his leg, but his his foot. Uh, in a motorcycle accident, and the film makes it look like after he won the title off a of flare, that's when it happened. It's not it happened like three years later. So, and also, too, the film uh, doesn't show the families of these Von Erichs, as I think almost every, I think every one of them was married to at the time. They make them all seem like they were alone because at the end, you know, Carrie especially, you know, when Kevin's like, "Oh, you should be with so and so." Like if you feel alone, and he's like, "Who?" He, you know, he was married. You know, and he's coming <laughs> around with you know just some random goth chick. You know, so. <laughs> right? Yeah. So that's one thing that the film omits, which again I get because again. It's a film, not a TV series. Like, that's why I do think it would have worked a little bit better as like a mini series because you'd have enough time and depth to kind of go in more into like the backstories, things that happened and led up to it, et cetera. But, you know, it's it pretty good for what we got. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think they, they did a good job with it despite, you know, obviously taking liberties. So. Which um, every biopic does. Yeah, it, of course. <laughs> you know, there's, there's no way that you can you can't you can't cover everything. So you you have to take liberties, and obviously it's a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more, um, you know, entertaining, I guess, to see that you know Carrie loses his foot right after the championship. You know, obviously, like serendipitously, that would be like horrible. Um, and in, you know, in reality, it didn't happen. But um, 
I think they just take some some of those liberties for to get that shocking scene of him walking into the kitchen and you're like, oh, he's you know, look, look at him, he's fine. He's just got a little scrape on his uh on his back, and then all of a sudden he kind of turns around and you see, oh, missing a foot. Um, it's a nice little shot, but it, we, we, I mean, I guess for people who know this the history, it's not really that it wouldn't be that surprising, right? But um, for people who don't, it's a nice little shot. Um. So let's give uh, the Iron Claw rating. So on a scale of zero to ten, family barbers who don't know how the fuck to cut hair. <laughs> oh, dude, Zach Efron is the worst. His <laughs> fucking hair is so bad. I mean, at that point, like you must have gone to barber school to get it consistently bad across the board for all <laughs> for all brothers, right? Like, like that takes some work. You, you know think- what's great is great too. If you look at like all the Von Eriks, like how they actually looked and stuff, their hair is essentially like fucking. They look like uh, Mark Hamill in the original Star Wars, mm-hmm. just running around like, yeah. "Well, I'm an island. I'm going to go to Taji Station to get power." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even uh, even like in the in the little dream sequence there, where we see uh, um, Jack Junior. Even he's yeah. got a fu- even in heaven, they couldn't get the haircuts right. So, um, <laughs> zero out of 10, what would you give the Iron Claw? I give it an, uh, wait, I don't want. I told you, barbers. Who, oh, uh, yeah, oh. Bar- barbers who, uh, <laughs> family barbers who struggle with haircuts. Um, I'll give it an eight out of 10. It's a really good movie. Uh, I liked it a lot. Um, I think, uh, surprisingly, Zach Efron is really good as, uh, Kevin Von Eric. Um, I haven't really seen Zach Efron's work, to be honest with you. I know the name, obviously, because uh, it's one of your sister's uh, high school heartthrobs. But he did a really good job, you know, and everyone in this role, in this movie, does a really good job. Uh, Jeremy Allen White as Carrie Von Eric, outside of being like a foot shorter than Carrie, uh, he does look and does a great job as the old Texas tornado himself. Um, Holt McCallany as Fritz, great. Just a surly, stubborn bastard you know they're all you know it's all outside the guy that played flair everyone you know is really good in this put in really good uh you know put in good roles and you know made the story work and be really cohesive it's a slow burn of a film there's no real climax in the film it's all kind of just rising action and then just you know just very slow like build 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 and then just kind of ends but i mean it's kind of fine because again it's telling the story of the von eric so it's not like the things that i think narratively that are supposed to hit that beat don't really hit that beat because it's you know a very you know kind of a small film but it it all works the one like the one thing that i you know didn't really enjoy too much about the film was just again i think it would have been nicer to see a little bit more wrestling aspect to it you know to kind of make you feel more invested into what was going on at the time again i get it for like time's sake you know you can't really do that because the film's already two you know over two hours long but it would have been a nice thing to add because again it kind of makes what they're doing seem really truncated because they have like a quick like two second match and then you got Fritz telling, you know, Zach, you know, well, if you have your next match, you might be fighting for the NWA World Championship. And then that World Championship match is like, you know, not like a big part of the film. You know, kind of flies in the face of the importance of that event. You know? Yeah. But outside of that, yeah, I, 8 out of 10. I liked it a lot. I thought it was real good. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I would give it an 8 out of 10 as well. I think it's a really good movie. Um, you know, even if you're not really a fan of wrestling, it's a good movie about family dynamics, about, uh, the obsession of, um, furthering, you know, what you can do, um, obsession with getting fit, um, doing, you know, wrestling, uh, as a, you know, as a career, um, especially in the eighties, the, the, how much, you know, how much was actually involved in that. And, um, you know, a good depiction of the Von Erich family and whether it's, you know, wholly realistic to what actually happened, 
uh, I can't really say, but in terms of watching it as a movie, um, you know, for what it depicts in the, in the perspective that it depicts, I think it does a really good job of showcasing, uh, you know, the, how the family life, um, affected all of these people. And, you know, it does a really good job showing the lead up to those tragedies. So it may be a slow burn and it may take a while to get there, but, you know, at, probably after I want to say maybe that the half of the movie, um, it really is kind of like, like you said, there's really no like climax to it. It's almost like you get rising action and then just like a really downtrodden story for the next, you know, hour or so that it lasts of, of kind of like depressing event after event. So there's really no, like, there's no high point where you're reaching and then, you know, you get the resolution. Um, it's, it's almost like a descent really, um, you know, of happiness and then into a descent into sad elements until eventually at the end of the movie, you have that epiphany of like, well, maybe this is just not the things that we're doing. It's just not working. Um, and we need to get kind of get out of that. So I really liked it. I, I think that the ending of the movie is, um, you know, emotional and effective and it does a really great job of that. And, uh, if it truly was said too, like even better, uh, as an actual quote, um, I think it works really well. So the movie is really interesting. Give it a watch, especially if you're fans of wrestling, but, um, even if not, I think there's a lot to like here, um, regardless. So, uh, very, very good movie. Great, great outing for us seeing it together and alone in theaters. All right. So um, what do we got next on the docket? I know that Mean Girls releases this Friday. Mean Girls, the musical. <laughs> I'm seeing early reviews that I've seen basically said, why? Why? Because it doesn't offer anything new, retreads the same jokes, and yet there's music in it too. Which well, sounds like a nightmare to me, honestly. I mean, I do like musicals, but I mean, I'm not. I'm not a fan of musicals, so. I don't Still, know. Still, though, I mean, I'm not running the. I'm in no rush to do that right now. We I didn't agree. rock. You didn't. You know, we had to wait of nearly 10 years on the program to finally do Mean Girls. So we're not. We're not just hopping right into the musical, okay? Mm-hmm. Was that even coming to theaters? Or that could be like Paramount only. Uh, it's in theaters. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I don't think we've we've quite yet picked our slate of movies that we're looking to cover um, in the future. But uh, I know we're we'll come up with something interesting. Maybe it's time to go back to like a like a spaghetti western or something. I don't know. Something like that. Um, we still got to do, I think we wanted to do uh, um, a John Saxon month as well, right? Probably do, we want to do that for February for like Man Crush, uh, <laughs> February Man Crush for Saxon. Sure. So, yeah. Stuff coming up. You'll definitely want to check it out. More of Blood and Black Rum podcast in 2024, of course. Um, I don't want to say that we're going to, there's new stuff coming, like nothing that's going to reinvent the wheel, but you're going to get more of the same, which is always great. Always welcome from Blood and Black Crumb Podcast. So we appreciate you listening. Um, and if you do want to listen to us more or listen to our old episodes, which I do think I'm going to try to go back through and kind of like uh, edit them to make the recordings even sound a little bit more crisp and neat, um, you should check us out on our any podcast app, really. We're on everything. Uh, our home base at Spotify or Apple Podcasts, whatever you use. I'm sure we're there. Subscribe to us. Leave us a nice review. Uh, we're on Facebook and Twitter. Search for us, Blood and Black Rum Podcast. We have an email address, Blood and Black Rum Podcast at gmail.com, or you can write to us. Let us know what you like and what do you want us to cover for films, and we'll take that into consideration. Uh, you can also donate to us at our Patreon page or on our Spotify page. Um, anything you donate will be put towards beer, or in this case, for this month, non-alcoholic beer because it's fucking expensive regardless of it being non-alcoholic so we appreciate that too we're just gonna do a bottle of water <laughs> yeah 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 the non-alcoholic of choice a bottle of water delicious quenching <laughs> what do you have i have poland spring what do you have 
Great value. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, or or even better yet, because we're not using, we wouldn't be using any plastic bottles. Just my Brita. Just gonna grab my Brita from the fridge. Well, aren't you fucking got a never-ending supply of it in there? Um. Yeah. So, thanks for listening, everybody. Hope you enjoyed our episode on the Iron Claw. We hope you come back soon to hear our next episodes, which we aren't real. Uh, you know, we we don't have. A, definitely definite <laughs> knowledge of what we're going to do yet but uh you'll want to find out when we come back in two weeks so thanks for listening until next time take care <laughs>